So this is a joint work with Todd Milstein from UCLA and Madame Mutuwasi from Microsoft Research. So today, today I'm going to show you a problem of Java and how we're going to fix it. Is Java a safe language? We all think Java is a safe language. But here is an example in Java. Here we have two threads, thread T and thread U. Thread T is creating a new object P, and thread U first check to see if the pointer to the object is not now. If it is not now, it means the initialization of P has finished. So then thread U can call some methods of the variable P. Now this program looks perfectly fine here. However, if you want to execute it in Java, you may get a problem. And let me explain it to you. So the process of creating a new object actually consists of multiple steps, as I've shown here. Uh, first, you have to allocate the memory for the new object, and then you have to initialize the field of the object. And only after that can you assign the pointer to the new object to the variable P. The problem with Java is that Java allows compilers and hardware to do certain optimizations that might reorder the ordering of instructions. For example, if these two instructions get reordered, and now we have a problem. Because now it's possible that when thread U is at line C, thread T is still initializing the problem, uh, the, the object. And now we have a security vulnerability because now we are exposing a partially constructed object, and thread U is actually seeing the memory it is not supposed to be seen. Now to fix this kind of problem, one thing to do, one thing you can do is that you can declare P as volatile. In Java, if you declare some variable as volatile, it will disable optimization that reorder instructions related to this variable, and that's how you can get a per thread program order, and that's how you can restore the expected semantics. And we call this kind of error missing annotation errors, because, well, basically, you have this kind of errors only because you miss some annotations. Now, this kind of errors actually very common. If you just search online, for example, if you search it in Apache bug, the repository, you can find many cases of such bugs. Like here you can see there are bugs from HDFS, from log4j, or from Spark. There are real projects and real errors here. Now before I talk more about this, let's take a step back and think about Java. So Java is a safe language, or it tries to be a safe language. So in many design aspects of Java, it follows the principle of safe by default. By safe here, I mean it protects the basic program abstraction. Now with, this, uh, with some program instruction, now you can have baseline safety guarantee for all programs by default. For example, think about memory safety. Memory safety protects the abstraction of logical variables. That you can have infinite number of logical variables, but they should all be isolated from each other. They should never overlap. Now if you can protect this kind of program instruction, now it, 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 you can get baseline safety guarantee for, uh, that no memory access errors can ever happen, that you are never going to see memory you are not, uh, not supposed to be seeing. Now, of course, safety usually comes at a cost, and that cost at, at a lot of times is performance. So Java, as an escape hatch, also provides you performance by choice that it allows you to write some certain parts of your code as unsafe, but you can get better performance for it. And in the case of memory safety, you have native methods. If you write native methods, you don't get safety guarantee or safety constraints for memory safety, uh, but instead you get a bad performance. However, on the other side, it also means that if you want your program to be safe, you have to manually inspect the part of code that are non-safe. The similar idea can apply for type safety. So type safety provide, uh, protects the abstraction that types are like APIs. It tells you how to interact with the, with the data. Now with this kind of abstraction, now we have the baseline guarantee again, that we can only perform operations that are appropriate to certain types of data for all the programs by default. And similarly, if you want performance, you are also allowed to write some parts of the code that are not safe, but you can get better performance. In this case, again, native, code, native methods or native codes. If you write your method as native methods, you don't get guarantee from type safety, but on the other hand, but you get better performance. And on the other hand, you also have to inspect this part of code to make sure your whole program is safe. Now think about the example I just showed at the beginning of our talk. Now here we have the abstraction of a per thread program order. And this is a very important abstraction because just as I showed you in the example, if you don't have this kind of abstraction, you can have security vulnerabilities. So we should protect this kind of abstraction and if we follow the same idea of safe by default, which we would also want to preserve this kind of abstraction and give some baseline safety guarantee for all programs by default. 
But just as I showed you, this is not, not the case with Java today. So Java now, it only preserves this kind of abstraction, it only gives you this kind of safety guarantee for some programs, for the well-annotated ones. So if you don't do anything, you don't get safety. It's more like safe by choice, it's not safe by default. Uh, so we believe what Java should do instead is that it should follow this safe by default principle and protect this kind of baseline safety guarantee for all programs by default. Now there's a formal concept of talking about the behaviors of memory reads and writes, and it's called memory models. And uh, the memory model that can preserve a program order for all programs is called sequential consistency. So of course, if you still want some escape hashes, you should allow pr uh, programmers to write some non-NC code to allow the reordering of instructions to get better performance for optimizations. But Java is not doing it today. And why is that? Because people believe that sequential consistency is so. Actually, we just cite some text from some recent papers from top conferences. So people say that NC is woefully unrealistic or NC will cripple the performance of Java programs on all modern microprocessors. But is that the case? Let's actually find out. So here's our contribution. First, we propose a water by default semantics for Java, which follows the safe by default principle of Java that uh, in this semantics, all heap accesses are treated as volatile by default, and that's how you can have sequential consistency at the bytecode level. And uh, also as an escape hatch, experts are allowed to write certain methods and annotate them as relaxed. If you annotate some methods as relaxed in volatile by default semantics, uh, it, it will fall back to the original Java memory model, and the heap access will not be treated by volatile by default, only the annotated one will be treated as volatile. And we also implemented JVM. We call it VBD Hasbach, which gives you water by the most semantics for JVM. Uh, because we implemented at the J level of JVM, we can actually execute any application that are compiled into Java bytecode. For example, Scala, applica uh, Scala application as well. And this is a modification to the Hasbach JVM in OpenJDK, uh, a widely used JDK today, which is also a reference in uh, implementation of Java. So to the best of our knowledge, this is the first implementation of sequential consistency on a production JVM. On a production JVM that has the advanced uh, compiler te technologies such as dynamic loading or uh, JIT compilation. And to implement Volatile by default, already there's a conceptually simple change that we have to flip the default from non-volatile to volatile. Therefore, our implementation largely reused the existing implementation of volatile keywords in Java and our correctness also based on that. And the, the focus of our performance evaluation is more on server-side applications running on x86 because uh, this is a common use case of Java applications today. Uh, so for example, uh, like web servers or big data processing machine learning work nodes. So the implementation is available on GitHub. You can get it and compile it yourself if you want to run it or test it. And it's also artifact evaluated. Now, before I talk more about uh, implementation, let me give you a quick peek into the key results we find. So we found out that on a more than 12-4 Intel server, the overhead of our VBD hotspot against the original JVM is 28% for the couple benchmarks, and 19% for Spark machine learning benchmarks, and 12% for Spark big data uh, and analytics benchmarks. Now, this is not negligible, but I would say this is still a very interesting result because it's far from what I would expect from triple the performance of your program. And uh, we also want to study the potential of relaxed annotations. So we did another, another test and found out that if, we, if the pro programmers can use relaxed annotations, they can actually see a huge overhead reduction with a few relaxed annotations. And another test we did is that we want to study how the overhead of volatile by default changes if we have more concurrency. And another, I would say, still interesting result is that we actually found out the relative overhead of volatile by default hotspot actually decreases if we have more concurrency. So, just as a quick summary, we believe that volatile by default can be a practical choice today for common service side applications, at least on x86. But we have to talk about implementation for a second. So the actual implementation of water by default into a production JVM consists, involves a lot of details. But in today's talk, I'm only going to give you a high-level idea of how we design and uh, implement this. 
So we built VBD hotspot uh, based on hotspot JVM. Hotspot JVM uses a JIT compilation, which means that by default, all methods will be executed by the interpreter. And uh, if the uh, methods are hot enough, they will be compiled. So Hotspot JVM has one interpreter and two compilers, uh, one client compiler and one server compiler. The client compiler has a faster startup time, but the server compiler is more optimized. Because our focus is on server applications, in our implementation, we only use the interpreter and the server compiler. So to make the whole JVM worked out by default, we must make sure the interpreter is worked out by default and the compiler is also worked out by default. Now let's take a look at the interpreter first. So the interpreter in house by JVM is a template-based interpreter, which means that JVM will generate template code for each bytecode during JVM startup time. And in the original uh, JVM, uh, the word hole semantics is preserved by inserting fancy instructions after every word hole writes. So therefore, in our implementation, all we have to do is that we have to make sure that there are this kind of fancy instructions after all he writes. So this is how we treat the uh, interpreter. And talking about compilers. So the compiler will generate an intermediate representation for the methods when they are compiling these methods. And then later they can do some optimizations and generate another IR and do some more optimization and then machine code. But the key idea here is that the world of semantics is preserved by, by the compiler by inserting this kind of memory barrier nodes around the every world of reason rights in the higher level IR. So what we have to do is that we must make sure that there are this kind of higher level, uh, this kind of memory barrier nodes in the higher level IR for all heap accesses. So again, this is just a quick review. If you are interested in the details, we can refer to our papers. So let's talk about the results. Uh, we first test the overhead of our VBD hotspot uh, on the couple of benchmarks, uh, standard benchmarks to test the performance of Java. And uh, we're using a existing methodology of Java performance evaluation. So this is actually the OOPSA 10 years most influential work paper here. So we use their methodology. And on the right here is the result. Uh, so here it shows the relative execution time of VBD hotspot against the original JVM. Uh, it is the relative execution time. So for example, for Aurora, you see the relative execution time is 1.20. It means that our has 20%. So the lower the better. Now from this result, we get the average overhead of VBD hotspot uh, over the original JVM is 28%. Now the couple is a very good uh, standard benchmark, but as we said, we want to focus more on the server side applications. And one the predominantly used cases of server side application nowadays is big data analysis. And just as I mentioned, because we can execute Scala, we can execute Spark. So we use this Spark test from Spark Perf benchmarks from uh, GitHub, written by Databricks, a very famous Spark company. So we use their uh, benchmarks and tested. And on the right, here is the result. Um, if you look at it, the, the blue bar represents the execution time of, of each test in the original JVM. And the red bar represents the execution time of each test in the original JVM, and the blue bar represents the execution time near our VPD hotspot. And if you just look at the result, for most of the tests, the overhead is very, very small, except one, scheduling throughput. And we manually inspected the test code of this test and found out that this test, they specifically test, uh, there are a lot of serialization and deserialization going on in this test. Because there are a lot of serialization and deserialization, there are a lot of shared memory reads and writes. And for every memory reads and write, because we are well taught by default, we are disabling optimization that can be applied to those to them. So this is why we have a huge overhead for this test. But even with this outlier, the average overhead is only just 12%. So we did a similar test for machine learning uh, tests, machine learning benchmarks. So we are also we're still using this Spark Perf benchmark and using the MLlib test. And MLlib is a commonly used uh, machine learning library in Scala. So uh, you can find more details of this graph in the paper, but the kind of idea is that the average overhead over more than 100 tests in these benchmarks is only 19%. So again, I would say this is less than people had previously assumed. Another thing we want to test is that we want to see how much potential we can have if the programmers are allowed to annotate some methods as relaxed. So in this test, first we chose to, uh, uh, the test that has the highest, or highest overhead when executing VBD hotspot in, in the couple and uh, 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 Spark test. 
namely we, cho we chose FOP, low index sound flow scaling throughput, and Aurora. And for each of these tests, we did a quick and dirty profiling to find out what is the method that spent the most of the time executing in VBD hotspot. And we used those methods as candidates for relaxed annotations. So in this graph, x-axis shows how we mark how many methods are relaxed, and y-axis is the relative execution time. So again, the lower the better. So for example, if you just look at the blue index here, uh, the, the red line, if you don't use any relaxed annotations, the overhead is 80%, around 80%. But if you're allowed to use 20 relaxed annotations, you can actually reduce the overhead to less than 20%. I would say this is really promising. Uh, so we suggest, so generally with just 20 or fewer relaxed annotations on only those five benchmarks, we can reduce the average overhead of the couple from 28% to 18%, and we can reduce the average overhead of Spark uh, big data analytics benchmarks from 12% to 6.6%. And another common question we get or a common concern people have about strong memory models or SE is that, uh, well, how does the overhead change if you have more concurrency? Uh, so we also did another test to test that and we found out is that actually if you have more concurrency, the relative overhead of with the has is, is, is lower, it's actually lower. So let's quickly talk about the future work. So there are a few things we can do. Of, of course, we can try to optimize the, the implementation to get better, or, uh, to get smaller overhead, or we can do a better profiling so that you find better candidates for relaxed annotations. And the natural question is, what about R? So of course, we'll, we, will want, we would like to test it on Android and uh, applications, but we have some preliminary results, which is actually quite surprising that actually for big data and analytics benchmarks, the, the overhead of scaling throughput is much higher, but generally the, over, the overall overhead is just 14%. <laughs> so, conclusion. We believe safe language like Java should be safe by default. Not, uh, and therefore we propose water by default semantic for Java, which gives you safe by default and performance by choice. And we believe that this can be a practical choice for today's common source applications from our revelation results. Thank you.